Well, I grew up, basically, uh, I was born nearly 50 years ago. So I was a, a child of the 60s, basically, which sort of were a blank. Uh, I really started growing up, I think, in the 70s. I'm a glam rock kid. But Dublin, Ireland, in them days, was a very dark place, as in it was a very poor, almost third world. Uh, we are going through, economically, the whole world is going through a recession at the moment. Well, baby, the 60s, the 70s and the 80s in Ireland was a real recession. It wasn't a pleasant place. It was massive unemployment. We had huge political problems with the North. Uh, it was dull and grey. Uh, so I formed a band and tried to escape it all. So... It's a great country, a really beautiful, great country, but it's had its troubles. And the last 15 years, we had one of the biggest economic booms. We, we became, overnight, we became almost the wealthiest country in Europe. And last year, the bubble burst. But I think a few bubbles have burst in a few countries. So we're all going through the same thing. So... Let's say Ireland in the 70s and the 80s was tough. But if you grow up with a tough background, it makes you strong. One of the biggest sort of problems I found uh, with Irish politics and the economic thing was after, after the war, after World War II, most other European countries started to develop e economically and socially. But whatever way the Catholic Church, they took a grip and they almost governed the country. I mean, we were almost like a dictatorship. Uh, there's good and bad, uh, but we experienced an awful lot of bad, uh, especially from the institutions that taught children, the Christian brothers, etc. Uh, all those stories are all coming out now, not just in Ireland, in, in Canada, all over the world. So it was pretty intense. It was uh, the Catholic Church were almost, they were like our Edgar J. Hoover, if you know what I mean. They ruled the roost. Uh, but it had a huge, profound influence on me in that as you get older, you realize that you can't blame everything that there's good and bad and things get misdirected. So I would call myself a black Catholic, you know. I still have this attraction to it because all religions I'm not a fan of. I'm a fan of sort of belief and spirituality. So I would be, I would be into Christ rather than the Catholics. I was a very shy child. Uh, I didn't like football. I didn't like the usual stuff that was shoved down. Sports were always shoved down you. And the Gaelic language, which I've actually disliked as a kid. But um, as I grow up, I quite like it. My real name isn't Gavin. Uh, I was given Gavin Friday by my friends. I, I, I'm christened Fanon Hanvey, which is Gaelic. And there's no actual English translation. And I hated it as a kid, but... As I, as I grew up, I sort of went, no, I like it. My main influences were, I loved, I loved art. I mean, it sounds a little pretentious to say I was into art, but I liked drawing. I liked um, music. Music was my outlet from day one. You know, I was giving you an image of, of Ireland being this dull grey, Massive unemployment, not much going on, and the future was the dole queue. Uh, or, uh, and, and for me, the window of hope was music and books. So I fell in love with sort of T-Rex and David Bowie, very young. And they sort of said, hey, you don't have to live in this north side of Dublin that's all grey and depressed. You can be a spider and go to Mars. So uh, music uh, and, and books too, I read avidly as a kid. So, and that's the beautiful thing about books and music and, and even movies, is that you can actually escape, you can, you can go into other worlds. 
Lipton Village was a, a, an imaginary place, really. It was a group of young guys that grew up around the same area. I grew up on a street called Cedarwood Road. Um, and by coincidence, my best friends at around the age of 10 became a, a guy called Bono and another guy called Googie. Uh, and we just, it was music again. The fact that uh, <clears throat> that pulled us together. I lived at the, the, the bottom end of the street and they lived at the top end. And I was quite shy as a little kid. Uh, but they found me quite interesting because I had the right albums underneath my arm. You know those days where you'd carry the latest Bowie album or Roxy Music album as you go to school? I mean, you can't play an album at school, but you were being cool, just showing, look what I got. And I'm not into meatloaf. I'm into Bowie. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I, I attracted their attention, and I had long hair and earrings when it was quite a risque thing to do in Dublin. I mean, we didn't have the liberation that America and, and Britain had in, in, in the 60s. But I did always look to England and America, mainly because of the music that came from there. But we, we became friends through music. And <clears throat> we had real names, as I said, Fanon Hanvey and Derek Roan. What a dreadful name. <laughs> and Paul Hewson. Uh, we gave each other nicknames, just the way most kids do, you know. Uh, but the nicknames had more to do with how we physically looked or our essence. And I had quite square features as a, as a young kid, uh, almost like this. There was this surge, there was an ad on, on the TV, a surge pipe called Wavin. And it used to just come, Wavin piping. And this big square pipe would come. Um, I can be full on at moments. So I was called Wavin for a while. But I'm a bit so softer. I'm a little softer than a, <coughs> a sewerage pipe, so they changed that to Gavin. Now, I didn't choose it. It was Bono and Googie who gave it to me. And then Friday was added because I have a talent of getting on with most people. Um, so it's a bit of a Man Friday thing. And we gave each other these nicknames and, and then we we didn't we had similar interests. We were into sounds really pretentious that twelve, thirteen year old kids were like into art and poetry. But we were. We weren't into football. We were into making music or being into music and painting and stuff like that. And we call this sort of little gang Lipton Village. And we made up imaginary games and it's just one day we'll form bands and one day we'll make movies and one day we'll do this and one day we'll do that. But I think a lot of kids do this in their own way, except 25, 30 years later. Legend happens because some of us have become quite well known. So the myth becomes magical. So uh, I tend to sort of see it very practical for me. When I go out for a drink, <clears throat> Bono can buy the pints because he has more money than me. We're the same guys. That's a tough one. Uh, I've always, I've always, uh, I mean, as, as a performer on stage, I tend to sort of throw myself into the character, whatever I've written about. So it depends on how I'm writing or what I'm writing about. Uh, a, lo a lot of singers don't really know who they are. They sort of, um, they have this massive insecurity and this massive ego. And they're sort of pulled between both. I mean, why do you want a lot of people to look at you all the time and listen to you? There's something going on there. There's this sort of need to express and attention. It's not just ego, it's, it's some sort of complex thing. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you create characters to say something you want to say. And, uh, and then you just throw yourself into that. In the last couple of years, I've been acting a lot more. Um, I've done one or two movies. 
I've done a lot of work with the Royal Shakespearean Company, and that's been intense, baby, I can tell you that. Uh, I, lo I love the way an Irishman that can hardly speak proper English is doing Shakespeare, so I find that extraordinary as I get older. But I always see music, live shows, performances as moments. And to really get there, you just got to actually get into the essence, the flesh and the blood. Morris Caesar, um, I, I worked with for around, from around 87 till around 2004. How long is that? It's a long time. Um, I started working in a club called the Blue Jesus. I started this club called the Blue Jesus in... in uh, post virgin prunes and I painted for a couple of years and then I needed that light I was telling you about I needed that attention or I needed to open up and show people what's inside me I don't know uh, so I wanted to perform again but in a low key way so I did this speakeasy sort of vaudeville club called the Blue Jesus where I met up with Morris I, I, I'd come from a sort of a punk rock avant-garde background but as I as I sort of ended the band I started like getting into more to more sort of structured music and even classical and jazz uh, I started realizing hey before 1960 there was good music you know so uh, I decided I wanted to work with somebody that was classically trained and Morris was classically trained so that journey, we made three albums and numerous, numerous soundtrack and score and played about 10 years of shows. But it just sort of, it, 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 you know, Morris is playing uh, with me this weekend. Uh, we're still friends. But I just think the relationship came to an end spontaneously. He wanted to move to West Cork and plant trees with his wife. I didn't. <laughs> Certain things kick in when you hit your late 40s and shit, you know? It's nothing really to do with me. Uh, I was... I, th I think it, it's going back years. I think it was on some TV situation in RTE. And a lot of people think, uh, oh, what's he at now? He's doing this, he's doing... So what are you going to do next? And I said, I don't know. What do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I just want to get better. Um, who do you want to work? I don't know. And then he said, well, where would you play? I said, look, I'd love to play somewhere classic, somewhere legendary, a place where music was when music was. Uh, Carnegie Hall. I just said it like that. So it became this sort of, between my friends and different people, oh, Gav's going to play Carnegie Hall. Oh, Gav's going to play Carnegie Hall. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, maybe you'll do Shakespeare in Carnegie Hall. And it just became this thing over the years, like like a joke almost. Uh, and then, you know, the, uh, my friends, as I was talking about, were all turning 50 slowly or, or quickly. Uh, and Googie turned 50 in May. And we, a gang of us went to a really nice hotel and had a beautiful weekend. And... We had a few drinks, and uh, my good friend Bono says, uh, Hey, uh, you know what you're doing for your 50th? And I said, You know what? I don't really care. Whatever. Once I'm with my friends and loved ones and whatever. And he says, I know what you're doing for your 50th. I said, Really? He says, Yeah, you're going to be working. You're going to be making a show, and you're going to be working for Red. And... Um, when I have a few drinks on me, I can talk, but I shut up for the night. So I was a little taken aback, and it was sort of out of my control. I went, what's this about? But the guy who's putting the show together, Hal Wilner, I've worked with since 1988, and he's a little bit of a genius. Well, that's an understatement. He is a genius, in my mind. And I've done many of his collaborations and shows, and he just says, let's just see who wants to play with you and let's throw the dice up in the air and see what comes down. And, I mean, you've seen the cast. It's pretty extraordinary. You know? From Joel Gray to Rufus Wainwright to Martha Wainwright to Courtney Love.
to Maria McKee, to Eric Mingus, Lydia Lunch, to you two as you've never seen you two, as in it's Bono, it's Adam, it's Larry, it's Edge, to some ex-Virgin Prunes, Googie and Dick, to actresses, the incredible Elizabeth Ashley, Chloe Webb, and more, and surprise guests, Laurie Anderson. And I, I, after I leave this interview, I go to rehearse with Anthony Hegarty uh, for a few songs. Um, so w what I'm most excited about is a lot of music today is so over-rehearsed so worked out, so unspontaneous. And these events, we've got three days rehearsal, and there's been a lot of pre-production in thought and emails and letters and conversations, but you're getting a group of musicians, almost like a workshop, that love music, that are like pushing it out there and spontaneously doing something. And that's a rare thing in these days. And this... I don't know what's going to happen. And I love that. Because in these days and age, everything is so ordered and anal. And music is about spirit and spontaneity. And that's what we're going to do on Sunday night. Do you think I'm going to live till 100? I'll have to. Uh, maybe Bono can arrange that. That would be interesting. Hey, Bono, thank you for my 50th. Can you make me live another 50 years? Uh, you know, it's just such a pleasure to be, and an honor. Uh, and, and you know what's so great is that we're making money for AIDS in Africa. There's, there's a lot of love and spontaneity. We're doing something creative. That's what I love about Red. It's, it's not a, just a charity, give us money, give us money. It's being innovative. Like, here's a show that you won't see anywhere else. And, and you can come, and whatever you pay for your ticket, it's going somewhere. Uh, you can go and buy a pair of Armani shades like Bono, but the money goes to Africa. That's it's it's quite cool. But uh, I, I I'm actually quite modest. <laughs> all I want is a nice. All I want is a, is is a drink at midnight on Sunday night, and I'll be a very happy man. Uh,